if we could have the senators join us, Senator Fisher and Senator Shaheen. Um, and as you're coming to the table, I'll just say, I grew up in, in, when I came to Washington, it was a great community where Republicans and Democrats, you know, might have fought, to, fought each other on the floor, but after the hours, they were very good friends, and you cut your best deals um, when you were just friends and you were sitting around. Um, so I hope that we're able to talk a little bit about that today. So I was thrilled to learn that you were both actually friends. Are uh, we? <laughs> I, I, I think and we're I pretty much friends together. with all the women in the Senate. We're a minority, so we have to stick together, right? So, so I'm very good friends with former Senator Mary Landrieu, and when Mary first came to the Senate, she started doing those dinners at her home, which were so wonderful. And I think it really did create a camaraderie, uh, you know, between, you know, the senators who were from one party and the other. And I, I, I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit today about the very partisan divide that we see. And we often see it back at home. Um, and we see it on the cameras on the floors of the, the floor of the Senate and the floor of the House. Um, but, you know, talk a little bit about how you navigate that, if you would, because I think that for this crowd, a bunch of diplomats who clearly know how to um, negotiate, uh, you, know, what that, you know, what that looks like from, from, a Senate, from a Senate chair. Well, Senator Fisher and I went on a CODEL together back in the fall of 2017, I think. Um, there were five Republicans and two Democrats um, senators on that CODEL, and we all got along great. And Senator Fisher and I did a couple of events together talking about the role of women in politics. Um, I think one was at the university in Budapest. Um, and, you know, as you point out, the more we can develop relationships, the better we can get along because we trust each other. And I just led a CODEL with Jim Risch, and if you know Jim, who is the ranking member on the Foreign Relations Committee from Idaho, Jim and I don't agree on almost everything. <laughs> um, but we get along really well, and we co-led a delegation to Halifax, three Republicans, three Democrats, and I think we presented a, a surprising and very united front to the global leaders who were in Halifax for the International Security Forum because we got several questions about partisanship and we all were basically saying the same thing with respect to America's foreign policy. So while I think there's been a lot of talk about partisanship, I think most of you who are around the Senate a lot know that on most issues in the Senate, most of us get along pretty well and we work together quite closely. I would agree with that. Uh, Jean and I did uh, go on this CODEL, and what she didn't mention was our husbands were there as well. <laughs> so Billy and Bruce had a wonderful time. I have pictures of the two of them looking at their gadgets, you know, their phones trying to figure things out, and we were like, ugh, you know, let them <laughs> let do it, let them do it. But I think, I think that the Congress is a reflection of our country. And we are divided. Uh, it, is, it is, I think, becoming worse. But I would say to you that in the Senate, while it can get um, contentious sometimes on the floor and you hear things on, on different news shows um, that maybe sounds like we're, we're always fighting and, and hating each other, if you really watch C-SPAN, how many of you in here watch C-SPAN? I thought Real this junkies. would be a good yeah. crowd. <laughs> but, you, but you see senators talking on the floor, and you see Republicans and Democrats talking on the floor. Um, and, and we are friends. We are civil to each other. We realize that we come from different places and we have different views. We represent different constituencies. But in order to keep, to keep the relationships 
as a priority, uh, we do have Codell's where we're together. Jean and I were, were up with Angus King and we were in Minot, North Dakota, climbing down ICBM silos. Uh, so we were at Stratcom uh, getting a, a briefing on uh, our nuclear deterrent and how important that was. Uh, so we we reach out to our colleagues, and I think most every senator senator fully understands the importance of those relationships. You know, I worked in the Senate when I first moved to Washington, and we uh, used to always say. The Senate always sort of fixes the crazy things that the House does because it's a great deliberative body. And that's the, that's the key is talking and, and, and really, you know, sharing ideas and values. Um, as Senator Shaheen, around the world, women who stand for office are oftentimes targeted with threats and sometimes with violence. Um, what can we do to make it safer for women to take on more visible leadership roles, especially in, in communities where, you know, that's, you know, frowned upon? Well, I think one of the things we've got to do is continue to model the kind of values that we want to see in other countries, and having women in high-profile positions in the United States is really important with that respect. But then we also need to condemn that kind of violence, and we need to be very vocal about that. That is not acceptable. And it's important for officials from the United States, from the president on down, to be clear about that. Um, and obviously, there are other areas that we can support that promote democracy and civil society in other countries. One of the two of the organizations that I think do a great job with that are IRI and NDI, mm -hmm. um, who really encourage people to participate in their countries. So there's a lot that we need to do. Um, and, you know, I, for one, feel disappointed that we have not yet had a woman president in the United States. Um, it's <laughs> and we're about to lose, obviously, well, today is the last day for Chancellor Merkel, but she's been the most visible um, female presence on the global stage and has done a great job. So um, anything we can do to encourage women at all levels to run for public office, and it's not just globally, it's an issue here in the United States as well. So let's talk about that. Senator Fisher, you know, we've got more women in Congress than ever before, um, but we're still far from a 50% representation. Um, it, you know, what can we do to help, you know, help push the envelope on that. I agree with Jean that we have to model it. And we have to be able to, to speak, I believe, not just as women, but as senators. Please don't look at us and go, oh, that's a woman senator. Please look at us and say, there's two senators here today. <laughs> And I believe that a lot of times when we, when we get in these discussions about the importance of diversity, whether it's by gender or race or geographic diversity in this country, that's our strength. Let's not forget that we don't have to highlight that all the time. Let's, let's highlight who people are, what they do, and we're United States senators who happen to be women. I do want to turn because we've got such a, a great crowd of international experts here. Um, Senator Shaheen, you have been very outspoken in your opposition to withdraw from Afghanistan um, and your concern about what the Taliban control would do to the future of women and children. Um, um, for, you know, the Afghan, you know, women and girls. Um, with the ongoing refugee crisis and, and increasing threats and restrictions on women, um, what ongoing support is the U.S. offering and what, what, what are y'all's plans in the Senate to, you know, make sure that that area and those people are not forgotten? I think there are, the administration is standing up a task force to take a look at this issue. In fact, Stephanie Foster, who hopefully I'm not telling secrets, Stephanie, um, who is here is going to be part of that and helping to lead that effort. Um, but 
we've got to do everything we can to, right now, help with humanitarian assistance for women and children in Afghanistan, because as we know, the economy there has collapsed, and there is a huge threat of famine and everything that goes with that. The challenge is doing that in a way that doesn't allow the Taliban to um, siphon off funding um, because of the corruption in the country. But it's something that we've got to, and we're going to, in order to get that done, we're going to have to work with the Taliban in some capacity, which is um, unfortunate for those of us who think the Taliban haven't changed at all, and they continue to present the kind of threat that we saw before we went in on 9-11. You know, I, I think about the admonition that I was given by former ambassador to Afghanistan who said, you can't let your opposition to the Taliban prevent you from providing the humanitarian aid that people in the country are going to need with the withdrawal from the United States. And it's true. We've got to figure out some way to get this done because we can't let particularly all of the women who um, who were willing to come out and be visible and try and improve the country. We can't let them go without assistance. Um, Senator Fisher, um, you've also called on the administration to, to do more. What kind of leverage do you think the U.S. has um, in, 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 you know, with Afghanistan and the Taliban today? What, what should we be looking at, at leveraging? I, I would say step back and look at the broader picture. I think the United States has to remain and be active as a global leader. And we need to promote our values, what we believe is right, what we believe is true, and again, model that for, for the world to see. Uh, I've. I also think it doesn't matter what your stance was on the war in Afghanistan, whether you were for it or against it. I don't think it matters if you agreed with, with the withdrawal or not. But I think we can agree that it wasn't handled in the best way, the withdrawal that we saw from Afghanistan. And I think that has caused um, great harm for a million children in the country that are looking at, at famine. I think it's caused harm to the women in the country who are back in burqas. Uh, we have a family in Nebraska where the mother and father and son are all in Nebraska. The daughter was still in Afghanistan, 22. Uh, we have lost touch with her, our office, her family has, and she's alone over there. So she can't even go out because she doesn't have a male relative to take her out. Things like that we can't even imagine. But I agree with Jean in that <coughs> we must step forward with the rest of the nations and be able to address these immediate issues that we see now with hunger uh, and be able to address in any way we can. I don't think we have any leverage when it comes to addressing the rights of women in Afghanistan. I do not believe we have any leverage there. But we can uh, continue to meet our moral obligations in making sure that people and children especially are fed and taken care of. Let me, I certainly agree with Deb in her comments, but the one place where we do have some leverage, and it's really limited, is with diplomatic recognition. And we know that the Taliban are interested in being recognized in the international community, and we cannot let them ha that happen as long as they are behaving in the way that we are, they are behaving. So that is one really important issue that we need to keep front and center as we think about what's going on. And, and I would just thank, as somebody said in the opening remarks, thank all of you who are here, who are diplomats, who represent those countries who help with the evacuation, who spent 
many of the 20 years of that war with us um, because it really was not just an American effort, but there was help from a lot of allies and a lot of countries who have taken many of those Afghans as they were evacuating the country. So thank you very much. You know, it, it, it seems to me that regardless of sort of what issue comes before us on an international front, um, the way that you accomplish success, or at least stand up to meet that, is through a global coalition. Um, you can see that with the pandemic. You, you certainly could see it in Afghanistan. Um, you know, we've got some new threats that are out there. And um, with the recent, you know, concerning revelations about Russia amassing troops on the border and pointed warnings from the administration over the Havana syndrome and the Nord Stream 2 pipeline sanctions. Um, wh what can we, what should we think about in terms of a global coalition on, you know, Russia? Um, and um, where should we be focusing that energy? And, you know, what can Congress do or you as senators do to, you know, help, help educate people on why that's so important to the world and us? Well, Jen Stoltenberg spoke to Congress a couple of years ago and the Secretary General of NATO, and he started by saying, it is nice to have friends. And as we think about the situation that we're in, hopefully America and our allies are a much bigger global coalition than Russia or China have. And it's important for us to work very hard to nurture that coalition, to work with our allies. And one of the best things we can do in standing up to Putin right now is have a united front um, so that he understands that if sanctions are imposed, they're going to be imposed not just by the United States, but by the transatlantic community. Because it's going to mean a lot more to him if Europe, as well as the United States, imposes those sanctions. And I think what's being discussed right now in terms of removing Russia from the SWIFT financial system, um, I mean, these are serious. These, these kinds of sanctions would isolate Russia in a way that Putin needs to take seriously. Um, Senator Fisher, along those same lines, China's exhibited very aggressive military behavior, the buildup in the South China Seas, um, increasing worldwide naval presence um, and the recent escalation with Taiwan. Um, in your view, is direct military co confrontation inevitable with China? Um, you know, is, it, would that be, is that our, really one of our greatest threats or should we be allocating our resources to fight China in a different way or to address the Chinese concerns in a different way? Well, first of all, I agree with Jean about the importance of allies. The United States has friends, and the Chinese have customers. And that <laughs> makes a big, a big, big difference. Very well said. And we need to, we need to nurture um, those friendships, and we need to always show respect to our allies, because those friendships are invaluable. Uh, I am a strong believer in a, a strong military and being able to address the threats that we have. I push our, our Joint Chiefs, I push our Secretary of Defense, I push our combatant commanders to declassify information that senators receive frequently, two, two classifieds yesterday. On, on situations that we see around the world, but also the threats that we ourselves face as a homeland. Uh, recently, it was reported by the uh, Washington Post that the Chinese had 300 some ICBM silos that were discovered. I was so pleased that that came out publicly because of the importance that we modernize our nuclear deterrent, our nuclear triad. It has kept this country safe, and it has kept our allies safe, and I would argue that it has controlled the proliferation of nuclear weapons in this world because countries that have the know-how and resources 
to build nuclear weapons don't because of the umbrella and the safety that the United States provides them through our treaties. The Chinese um, are a nuclear power. They are a peer adversary. So the United States is now looking at Russia and China as two existential threats to, the, to our homeland. And that cannot be ignored any longer. And it needs, I think, by declassifying a lot of material that, that we have access to, uh, our, our citizens in this country will have a fuller understanding of the threats that we face on a military front, not just economic, but on a military front, and will um, be much more supportive of what we need to do in order to keep this country and our children and grandchildren safe. Thank you. You know, you really can't talk about China today without talking about the young female um, tennis player who accused a senior official of, of you know, sexual misconduct, um, and then she disappeared. Uh, and, and then, you know, once the, again, the value of a coalition, the global tennis organization sort of stepped forward and, and you know, it started getting some publicity on this, all of a sudden she made a reappearance. Um, it, it, you know, it's interesting that, you know, and I'm in the publicity game, that's, I'm in a pub public relations firm, um, how important that publicity is to make things happen. Um, what do you think about sort of that type of effort and the impact it has on the Olympics and and sort of China as a country that is very concerned about their you know public you know public opinion of them um, and is there anything that that you have been looking at in Congress to you know to support someone like that? Well, I haven't been looking at anything relative to that, but I would just applaud the Tennis Association for their willingness to withdraw from China. Now, I don't remember who said this, but one of our colleagues said that they had more balls than the, um, was it Major League Baseball? <laughs> NBA. NBA, thank you. <laughs> um, I thought that was an astute comment. It was one of those very senatorial comments. Yes. <laughs> we like those. Yeah, we do. Um, but, you know, the, Withdrawing our diplomatic, diplomats from the Chinese Winter Olympics, I think, is a step in pointing out where our values are with respect to what China is doing with the Uyghurs and um, the other repressive actions of the Chinese government. And so I do think it's really important for us to take those positions, and it makes a difference. You know, I can't. There are so many people that I've had a chance to meet with from around the world who are in repressive countries. Um, what Belarus, uh, Vladimir Karamurza, people who say, you know, you think it's a small thing when the United States speaks up, but it makes such a difference to those of us who are holding on, who need hope to continue the fight. So it's huge and it makes a huge difference. Um, you know, you both have, have developed wonderful careers in politics and are clearly um, leaders to be admired. Uh, as, as I've mentored young women uh, uh, during my career, um, you know, I've tried to give them, you know, sage advice or encouragement. Um, I'm just wondering for those in this room who are starting out their careers, unlike some of us who are at the back end, um, what advice can you offer young women on, you know, how to develop a good career and um, what sort of things do you think have been va invaluable to you as you, as the two of you have moved forward in your own careers? Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to introduce two of my mentors who are here. My chief of staff, Emily Leviner, and my deputy chief of staff and comms director, Brianna Puccini.
Now, I know your question was, was how do I mentor people, but this is a great example of young people who every day they mentor me. We won't get into details on how. <laughs> But they, are, they truly are two great examples of young people who, who have achieved so much already, I believe, who have um, a very strong core and spines of steel, and who continually work hard and grow every day. For us to be able to be around people like that I think is extremely important. In the summer, every summer in Nebraska, I have a, a, an event that's called Bridging the Gap. And it's for women of all ages, and we have women of all ages who are there. We've had different panels of people from Nebraska and beyond who share their experiences. And the goal of this is to be able to network and mentor and become leaders and I think it's just extremely important um, that, that different stories are heard, not just a story about moving up to be a CEO or moving up to be, to be a senator or whatever, but, but different stories. We had a life coach speak at this, a young lady who's a life coach. And to hear those experiences next to, next to a woman who is a, a district judge in the state of Nebraska, you know, to, to show young women, to show all women that there are different paths out there. There are different paths. And you have to be able to figure out what you love and what you're good at, because the two go together. If you aren't doing what you love, you're, you're not gonna, gonna be that good, good at it. it. <laughs> so you better figure out what you, what you love to do, uh, because it's, um, it's gonna make you uh, a person that's gonna be at the top of your field, and you're gonna have a great time doing it, and that's what's important. That's great advice. <laughs> Senator Shaheen. Well, I would say don't be afraid to fail um, because nobody succeeds at everything, so take the risk. And, uh, and then forget about balance. You know? <laughs> you know, you read all those about how do you balance your personal life and your career. I, I'm sort of, you know the scene in The Devil Wears Prada where she's just beginning to succeed and her boyfriend's leaving her and the, I forget what the character's name is, and he says, oh no, when, when your personal life is about to fall apart, that's when your career really takes off. <laughs> so, balance will work itself out. Suck, suck it up. <laughs> I don't know where we are on time. Um, but we'd love to take some questions from the audience. Uh Thank you very much for your comments and for your question. We know that right now we're in an international order that really was established at the end of World War II. And that's an international order that recognizes boundaries of countries, recognizes um, the ability of countries to determine their own fate and their own futures. And we cannot let Russia continue to um, invade countries in Europe that are autonomous countries um, like they have done in Georgia, like they tried to do in Montenegro, like they've done in Moldova, and like they've done in Ukraine. Um, because if we don't say enough and point out that that is not acceptable, then they, where are they going to stop? Where is Russia going to stop? What country in Europe is going to be um, free from the fear that Russia would come in. I mean, I had a meeting with Baltic, with 
parliamentarians from Estonia last week, and they are you know, quite concerned, as we know the Baltic nations are, about what Russia's next move is. Um, we're hearing the same thing from Poland. We're hearing that from Romania, all of the countries along the eastern border of Russia. So it's important for the United States and particularly the transatlantic community, but the international community as well, to stand up and say, this is not acceptable. We are not gonna accept this kind of behavior from a sovereign nation. I agree. It's, it's extremely important that the United States um, come together with allies and really show some firm resolve here uh, and, and lay it out to Putin on, on the feelings of the international community. Ukraine is a sovereign country. It has borders. Uh, those borders were breached in the past and not too much happened. I would hope that this time we will see um, any, any kind of options that can be looked at and agreed upon, whether it's, it's stricter sanctions, which Jean has mentioned, whether it's providing the Ukrainians uh, with anti-air, anti-tank equipment that will be beneficial to them um, if, if they are invaded. And when you, when you can just think of that. We're considering an invasion of a sovereign country in Europe. That, sh that should be of concern to, to everyone who has any kind of sense of history. Well, as the only woman on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, I feel your pain. <laughs> um, the fact is, we have an Office of Global Women's Issues. We tried to get that reauthorized in the state reauthorization um, legislation that is being amended to the, has been amended in the House to the defense bill. We were not able to get agreement from the other side of the aisle, and that's not because Senator Fisher objected but we have a few people on the other side of the aisle who objected to that. Um, we need to ensure that our foreign policy has a gender lens in it. And, and it's not just because women make up, you know, 50, more than 50% of the population. It's because we know that when women are involved in foreign policy, the outcomes are different and they're better. Because when we give women, when we give a woman help, a job, an education, she turns around and translates most of that help to her family, to her community, and to her country. So we know in developing nations around the world, empowering women makes a huge difference. We also know and I'm very proud to have worked with many of you in this room to pass the Women, Peace, and Security Act, um, which the United States was the first country to do to codify that, that says that when we are 
in conflict areas that women need to be at the table. And again, that's not just because we want women's opinion. There is data that shows that when women are involved in negotiations, that no, those negotiations last longer when it's the end of a conflict, and they are implemented in a way that is more inclusive. So there are reasons why this should be part of our foreign policy. And for all women, for women of color, um, it is critical. And that's why your voices and this organization is so important because you can bring that advocacy in a way that is much needed in Congress. So thank you for everything that you do. Um, it's a continuing fight, but your advocacy really makes a difference. I would say it's important to going back to mentoring and going back to networking and going back to leadership to be able to find women who can help you. We have, we have the only woman member of the Foreign Relations Committee here on the stage. Uh, to make those connections and say, I'm interested in this. And, and make sure that your, your background and your educational background are what's needed to fill these positions, too. I think it's, it's always important um, to hire qualified people, professional people, the best person for the job, and women need to get into those categories and then put yourself forward and be as self-assured as the guys that come in and interview with me. <laughs> and thank you, Christy Rogers, for a wonderful here, here. event. Well, I, for one, am thrilled that we have your voices on the Senate floor working hard on behalf of everyone in this room. And um, thank you so much. It's been a real honor for me to sit with you today and to have this conversation. So thank you. Everyone have a great holiday season, and thank you so much.